In this episode of The Design Tourist, I travel to Germany to explore the birthplace of the Bauhaus, a 20th century school of art, architecture, and design that continues to influence present-day modernism in all its forms. The Bauhaus translates as School of Building, and its teachings became both a style and a philosophy. We'll travel across the German state of Thuringia to explore how this short-lived school left a lasting impression. We begin our story of the Bauhaus at its birthplace in the city of Weimar in the German state of Thuringia. Weimar is rich in culture and complexities with constant reminders of its Nazi past and statues of buildings and commemorative plaques alongside its artistic legacy as home to famous poets, philosophers, musicians, artists, and writers. It's here, just before the outbreak of World War II, that a small arts and crafts school evolved into a worldwide movement known today as modernism. To understand how and why Bauhaus is so influential, we go back in time with my guide, Claudia, to tour the city's major Bauhaus landmarks, three of which are part of UNESCO World Heritage. Yeah, well, since we are not supposed to get close to each other, okay. uh, some people do the fist bump, some uh -oh. people do elbows, okay. but uh, I think it's a German specialty that we do the soccer bump or the football Boom. thing. Yay. Boom. <laughs> One more time, ready? Yes. Boom. All right, let's do okay. this. The Bauhaus School began in Weimar in 1919, the same year Germany founded its first democracy in Weimar. World War I had ended, ushering in a progressive mood for the new Bauhaus School's revolutionary ideas. To understand the origins of Bauhaus, we start at the new Weimar Museum, which chronicles the beginnings of modernism with Weimar's School of Arts and Crafts. Belgian designer Henry Vandeville, star architect of Weimar's intellectual class at the time, founded the school in 1902, which later evolved into the Bauhaus School under the leadership of Walter Gropius. And the idea is that if you use works, um, workshops um, and have an education based on much more practical ideas, less theoretical but more practical, um, then that should make a change to things. Because at that time, many products are um, produced in a very cheap way. Mm -hmm. And um, it's kind of degrading for the craftsmen because they, you know, people have the feeling like, oh, anyone can do that. So they say, we need this more practical thing and people need to actually work in the crafts. And this is what he builds the art school for. And this is one of the concepts that Gropius later uses in the Bauhaus as well. So this, um, these are some examples of what the people in the arts and craft school learn. The new Weimar Museum showcases art and design works considered contemporary and progressive for the times. The building was constructed in a neoclassical style that ironically embodies the historicism that the museum's founders were trying to escape. The museum opened in the beginning of the 20th century, at a time when many in Weimar wanted to break from the past and look to the future with fresh ideas. This mindset became the catalyst for the Bauhaus School in 1919. The museum's original director, Henry Kessler, filled the museum with modern art of the times to propel this idea of a progressive Weimar. Now, some thought he took it too far with the acquisition and display of these nude paintings that created a career-ending scandal. So, von, von Kessler steps down um, from his post because of the, the scandal that has been stirred up over these. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was a ridiculous thing, really, and it was more like a... Well, they seem very mild. As we walk through the city, its complicated history of democracy and dictatorship is evident in its architecture. Nazi-era and communist-era buildings stand next to the new Weimar Museum and near the Bauhaus Museum, 
as scars the city struggles to heal for humanity. Weimar was, among all the other nice people we had here, it was also a meeting point for the Nazis very early on. Uh, the Weimarians supported Hitler since 1925. And uh, so for the Nazi movement, uh, Weimar became a very important place before Hitler came to power in 1933. And afterwards, they had these buildings built. It was meant to be administrative buildings for the organizations of the party. Right. And uh, yeah, it, they never were finished because of the war, mm -hmm. but they were finished by the Soviet administrative, um, military administration. So it's, it's a bit like a scar within our town, really. And it's been really hard for us to kind of get this territory back and you, because you look at it and you go like oh this is Nazi buildings so um, for us it was a very important question if the new museum should really be built here in the, such a close um, vicinity of right. the buildings done by the Nazis because after all um, the, the Bauhaus had to leave Germany because of the, the Nazi party coming to power um, but what happens now is that people are actually walking around here, they are seeing the museums, they are looking at these buildings as well. We have also a, an exhibition history of the building. So people go like, what is this? And then they learn about it and they, they see that um, the Nazi part of history is also a part of Weimar's history, right? We can't deny right. that. Uh, but still we need to be informed about it. So this really puts it into perspective for me. So we're looking at the architecture of two dictatorships yes. right here. Yes, first the Nazi times and then during the GDR, which was also not, you know, they, they didn't have mm -hmm. free votes or freedom of press or any of those values. The complex is known as the Gau Forum. And just a few steps away, we arrive at the Bauhaus Museum of Weimar, which has the oldest collection of Bauhaus objects in the world. Bauhaus director Walter Gropius held on to these items that students created, and they're now on display. Bauhaus Museum Weimar, it was built and or finished rather in 2019, so it is pretty young still, and of course it was open for the big Bauhaus anniversary because Weimar, you know, the Bauhaus was built in Weimar in 1919 and 100 years later we opened this museum. And uh, yeah, it's focusing mo mostly on the Weimar period of the Bauhaus, you know, that it moved to Dessau and then to Berlin also, uh, because of political circumstances really. The Bauhaus School attracted leading artists, painters, craftspeople and thinkers from around the world to teach. They were known as the Masters. The illustrious list of instructors included Lionel Feininger, Paul Klee and Wassily Kandinsky. The Bauhaus aimed to unify the arts of graphic design, visual arts, architecture and craft into a multidisciplinary hands-on approach to learning. We're on the first floor of the Bauhaus Museum, which is a still public area. And we have here a nice overview of the 14 years that this Bauhaus as a school existed and also what happens afterwards. Because many of the Bauhaus people emigrate and take their ideas with them. Museum highlights include iconic Bauhaus objects such as the wagon-filled table lamp, the cradle designed by Peter Keeler, and the teapot by Marianne Brandy. There's also a collection of Bauhaus design chairs that invite you to sit and experience the designs. The Bauhaus School remained in Weimar until 1925, when conservatives came to power pulling its funding. So the school relocated to the industrial city of Dessau, Germany. Next, we head to the Bauhaus University of Weimar. It's a present day university that once housed the Bauhaus School. The Bauhaus University in Weimar continues to attract students in the arts, which is where we're going to explore the Bauhaus living legacy. So definitely at the top of my list on my visit to Weimar is to tour the Bauhaus University campus right here. This was the kind of the seeds of the Bauhaus movement. Bauhaus began here at this university. It later moved on to Dessau and on to Berlin. Today, it is a working university with students from all over the world. Now, you won't find any Bauhaus design buildings here. Most of the campus was designed by the architect Henry Vandeveld between 1904 and 1911. 
However, there are nods to modernism throughout. Two campus buildings have the designation as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. The University Cafe, Gift Shop, and Information Center was known as the Glass House when it served as a painting studio. Are you Bauhaus? Uh, that would be a big yes. I explore the university's main building, which houses the former office of Walter Gropius, the first director of the Bauhaus School in Weimar. It exemplifies his modernist mindset with furnishings that are replicas of his original designs. He designed the office as a cube, and that same cube geometry is echoed in the furniture as well. It is part of his complete idea of what modernism, modern design looked like, his vision. In the main building stairway, murals by artist Herbert Baer are on display, including this one depicting the Bauhaus logo with its three colors and three shapes. Bayer's mural paintings are a nod to the color theories of his instructor, Russian painter Wassily Kandinsky. The Vandeveld building, with its striking gable on the facade, is the former home of the Bauhaus School of Applied Arts, with workshops. In this building, a winding stairway showcases a mural of human figures by Oskar Schimmler, a Bauhaus instructor and one of the first Bauhaus artists labeled degenerate by the Nazis. Schimmler believed that it destroyed the Bauhaus and other cultural avant-garde in Germany. The main building and the Vandeveld building, which serve as the main headquarters of the Weimar Bauhaus from 1919 to 1925, staged the 1923 Bauhaus exhibition. This six-week event showcased the school's accomplishments to the public for the first time and produced Weimar's only Bauhaus design structure, House on Horn, a model house built for the exhibition. It was to be Bauhaus School's last hurrah before the conservatives came into power and cut funding to the Bauhaus, forcing them to flee. Many Bauhaus University graduates remain in Weimar, opening up retail shops and design studios that contribute to this city's cosmopolitan personality. I want to explore how the Bauhaus ideals live on today in fresh interpretations. So I visit the studio of fashion designer Anne Gorky, a graduate of the Bauhaus University in Weimar. One of the things that excites me most when I travel are these moments of serendipity, these unexpected connections that I make. Well, this Bauhaus sweatshirt is one of them. When I was at the Bauhaus Weimar Museum, I discovered this sweatshirt in the gift shop and I wanted to buy it, but we ran out of time. Well, later that evening, fashion designer Anne Gorky invited us into her home, which is also a working studio. And as we were taking a look at her line of clothing, I discovered this sweatshirt. Turns out Anne designed the Bauhaus sweatshirt and gifted it to me. And today I lovingly wear it. Hello, Karen. Hi. Nice to have you. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me into your home and into your workshop. Yes, of course. Okay, so you are a fashion designer who draws inspiration and creativity and a lot of ideals from Bauhaus. Yes. You were educated uh, at the Bauhaus true. University. Yes, yes I studied uh, at Bauhaus University and I, there I, I, I learned a certain way of working and um, elaborating ideas or working out I ideas and uh, thinking them, getting them translated into a, a product. And uh, also uh, um, most important to me, a way of collaborating of, of uh, different designers working together and putting their skills together and then coming up with a with a um, like product. Anne works out of her home. She founded the label Bauhaus Made as a collaboration with other designers. She also designs her own collection. <laughs> Anne says 
her design process is like building a house with strong architectural influences that reveal themselves in the silhouettes. She designs for function rather than ornamentation, a fundamental Bauhaus principle. I, I really try to to uh, to rather provide a sort of uniform for your for your uh, for your everyday. You know, there are also dresses and uh, things that are a bit louder um, uh, regarding the silhouette. But um, I, I I prefer to, to think in uh, clear lines, and I'm um, I I think it's uh, when things are over designed and there are too many things there that uh, distract you and that are really loud and that are re this is to me it's very noisy. This is something that I that I really do not feel comfortable mm -hmm. uh, with. It's rather really straight silhouettes and then there are these uh, like like breaks and these com color combinations that um, I really like and that I'm, I'm, I'm really mm, interested in putting f colors together and blue and black and what type of black and then putting a light blue into it and together with two reds and these um, this working with color to me is really really important and I think I got that certainly from from uh, from Bowes University and from my studies there when we come back I'll show you why Weimar was a muse to many famous poets, philosophers, and musicians as we explore the city's classical side of culture. I travel to understand my place in the world and in history. I travel to learn from the past and find inspiration in the present and imagine a better future. And in Weimar, this is where it all came together. Weimar was founded in the year 975 and enjoyed an age of enlightenment during the 18th century. During this time, art and culture thrived under the patronages of rich landowners, royal courts, and powerful politicians. The city's democratic and liberal atmosphere fostered humanistic aspirations. Weimar earned a World Heritage designation by UNESCO for its cultural contributions as a muse to many including Germany's famous poets Johann Wolfgang von Guter and Friedrich von Schiller, both Weimar residents. Johann Sebastian Bach also spent time in Weimar as a court musician. It started in the 18th century when a young man came to Weimar and his name was Goethe and he was to become our national poet. But at that time he was in his mid-twenties and uh, he had written a book that was very famous, Sorrows of Young Werther, mm -hmm. um, and our count was really into him. So he asked him to come to Weimar and he actually asked him to help um, to help reign the duchy, which at that time was, of course, extraordinary because normally you had to be noble right. to reign anything, right? But Goethe so, yes. was culturally, right. it was a great place to be. Right. And they were relatively, for the time, relatively open-minded. Culture was an expression of wealth and prestige in Weimar. The ruling duke invited Goethe to Weimar to work as a national poet and serve as a politician. Guter's home is open for tours along with the museum as part of the UNESCO's Memory of the World program. The statues of both famous poets, Guter and Schiller, overlook the theater square in front of the German National Theater, which once housed the National Assembly. In 1919, the Constitution was signed here, turning Germany into a democratic republic. Probably the the motive that has most been photographed. Both Goethe and Schiller have lived here in Weimar, Goethe for a very long time, nearly or over 50 years, I think. Uh, Schiller for a shorter period of time, but in their cooperation, they have created really great work um, that is still read in German schools. This is the house where Schiller lived for an, actually a short period of time because he died so early, uh, with 45 years. And uh, at that time he was really the most beloved German poet and uh, he really contributed a great uh, many things to our uh, culture. He wrote so many plays that are still very popular and that are still on stage, uh, performed on stage regularly. Uh, for example, Wilhelm Tell, 
um, and Maria Stewart. So he covered um, a lot of historic topics as well. And Goethe and Schiller together really got the actors to speak the text as it was written. And that is something that we still have in the theatres today. So you could go to a theatre and have your little textbook and they would say exactly the words as Schiller has written them. And um, so it's something that still has an influence on our life today. So what brought Schiller to Weimar? Um, basically, he wanted to work with Goethe. Goethe at that time was already very famous. He was a couple of years older than Schiller. So it was um, a great meeting of the minds. Definitely, it was an extraordinary moment, really. And yeah. we also have the museum. We also have the so Schiller Museum, the, which was an addition in the 1980s, and they have um, contemporary exhibitions there. Goethe died at age 83, marking the end of Weimar's Golden Age. When we come back, I'll take you on a tour of the Hotel Elephant, where I stay in style in Weimar. In the city of Weimar, I chose to stay at the Hotel Elephant. It has hundreds of years of history. The name comes from a time when people couldn't read, so they used symbols as a way to understand addresses and locations. The original owner decided on the elephant as a symbol of his hotel because it was exotic and it commanded attention. Let's go inside. During my stay, the hotel was celebrating its 325th birthday, originating on the site in 1541. Today, Hotel Elephant is a Marriott autograph property. The hotel lobby served as a living room for the city of Weimar, playing host to many famous names in art, politics, poetry, and literature. Every shelf has a focus on art, literature, or architecture, each with a theme. And the walls are filled with art from the hotel's impressive collection. In the 20th century, many of the Bauhaus masters met here. Oh, if these walls could talk. Adolf Hitler came here and he fell in love with this hotel. He did? So, yes, in the, on the route from Munich to Berlin, Weimar was, was very uh, uh, oh, practic it practical. Was before you practical uh, yeah. stop. At the time, the state of Thuringia was friendly to Hitler. He could speak publicly and openly, so Weimar became an operational base for the Nazi party. Hitler wielded his influence to demolish the hotel in 1937 and rebuild it in his vision of what he thought was German modern style. This suite is where Hitler would appear on the balcony to the crowds gathered below in the market square, chanting for him to come out and greet them. Today it's known as a Thomas Mann suite, and it's the hotel's largest overlooking the city square and marketplace. There was no Hitler suite which everybody thought this is the Hitler suite by name. But Hitler had his own apartment in the hotel. Weimar is where the golden age meets the modern age, an intellectual and cultural capital of Germany with a complex relationship with history. It's the scene of some of the world's greatest art, literary and cultural achievements. I say goodbye to this fascinating city with a newfound appreciation of how beauty and darkness can coexist to teach us all. Until the design tourist travels again, Stay curious and stay inspired.